Welcome to the NWA ETC Echo. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood to introduce our guest. Well, uh, David Spock doesn't need much introduction, but uh, just as a reminder, David is a professor of medicine here and PI of our HIV Echo, and I'll turn it over to David. All right, welcome everybody. So if you don't have a piece of paper out, grab one. We're going to present five clinical cases, and I thought we'd do this as a little bit different because we've had some fantastic medical updates on current cutting-edge information, but I wanted to emphasize this so that we don't lose sight of the basics. And being able to recognize and manage some common skin problems is a very important component of HIV clinical care. So with that in mind, we're going to jump right in and start here. Okay, so first case, let's jump right in. So this is an HIV-infected individual with a very low CD4 count, and he had these multiple papular lesions on his face, and his CD4 count had been persistently less than 100. He was not on any antiretroviral therapy at this time, and he had tried several remedies, including acne medications, some topical antibiotics, and none of those seem to have any impact on these lesions. So looking at a representative similar skin biopsy, if you were to have biopsied him, you would have seen these type of similar histologic findings. And these are what we call Henderson-Patterson bodies. Okay, so we have advanced HIV disease, papular lesions that are not responding to topical therapy, a biopsy showing Henderson-Patterson bodies, so the first question, which will be worth two points, one for each of those, is write down what you think your diagnosis is. And then secondly, if you are going to choose one primary therapy for this patient to try and make these lesions better, what would it be? I'll give you just a second. Okay, so looking at the diagnosis, what this individual has is molluscum contagiosum. And this is a very common problem in people with advanced HIV diseases. Everyone knows this is a very problem, common problem in pediatric medicine. But in HIV, it, it really manifests very differently in terms of these papular lesions that just don't get better. They're often located on the face and the genital tract. And this is a representative image showing a giant molluscum. This next image is showing you very severe molluscum around the the eye and these periorbital molluscum were very severe and disfiguring this individual, and he responded to antiretroviral therapy. So the correct answers here are, this is molluscum contagiosum, which is caused by molluscum pox virus, and the primary therapy for this is antiretroviral therapy. Now, if you need some topical agents, you can actually use some, and the specific topical agents you can use are things like topical Retin-A, which is often used as a cosmetic agent, but it's actually very effective for molluscum as well, too. You can also, for an isolated lesion, use local destructive measures such as liquid nitrogen. So molluscum contagiosum, treat with antiretroviral therapy. Okay, moving on to case two. And I'm going to try and leave some time for questions at the end because we'll be zipping through these. Now, I've got three photographs of three men that have the same disorder, and they all presented with very similar clinical histories. This individual has a CD4 count less than 100, and he presents with this chronic lesion on his right ear. And if you look at this particular image, what you'll notice is that right at the top of the ear in the penny, he's got these erosions that have developed. And look in the posterior region of the ear, you can see this as well, too. This next patient is a very similar presentation. CD4 count was less than 50. This lesion had been present on this patient for approximately six weeks. They were gradually expanding, and, and they actually increased in the number of lesions that were seen as well, too. The third is an individual with uh, also very advanced HIV disease who had this lesion that he felt like something was eating away at his ear. This did not respond to topical antibiotics. It did not respond to oral antimicrobials with cephalexin. All three of these individuals had these lesions for more than one month. So the question here is, what is your diagnosis? And then the second, an interesting question, too, 
is, is this actually an age-defining condition? Yes or no? I'll give you a second. The correct answer here is this is actually chronic ulcerative herpes simplex. And we used to see this very frequently because of the high percentage of individuals who had very advanced HIV disease, and many of the younger clinicians have really not seen this very often. And my general rule of thumb was anybody that I saw with a chronic ulcer, I did a culture and FA for herpes uh, to rule out chronic ulcerative herpes simplex because it is a very difficult diagnosis. Now, interestingly, these individuals have an AIDS-defining illness defined by this chronic ulcerative herpes if the lesions have been present for at least one month. The therapy for this is really straightforward. You can use standard herpes therapy with acyclovir, valacyclovir, or famcyclovir, but the difference is, is that with these chronic ulcerative lesions, you usually cannot get by with a five to seven day treatment. Usually these are going to require two to three or sometimes even four to five weeks of therapy to get rid of the lesions and to have them clinically resolve. Okay, case three. This is an individual who had had a lesion on his face that had been there for approximately about three to four weeks. What he described was an initial lesion just above his lip, and this lesion gradually expanded, and he thought it was a herpes lesion, and he took his acyclovir that he had for recurrent herpes simplex that was predominantly genital herpes simplex, and he took the acyclovir for about three weeks and at 800 milligrams three times a day, and it seemed to get better for the first couple days, but then he described no improvement at all, and the lesion actually expanded up into his nose area and became very painful. He described this as sort of a raw burning sensation on his face, and he was admitted to the hospital for further evaluation, diagnosis, and management. His history as well that was relevant is that because of his chronic intermittent outbreaks of herpes simplex, he had actually taken acyclovir on a regular basis for a period of several years, and, and I should say that on a regular basis, meaning he had had recurrent outbreaks and had total probably five to six times a year had taken acyclovir. So now that we have this individual who has this chronic lesion on his face that is not responding to acyclovir, and he's had this history of recurrent herpes simplex infections, what would you actually treat this with? Would it be A, oral val acyclovir? Would it be B, IV gancyclovir? Would you treat with C, oral val gancyclovir? Or D, IV foscarnate? The correct answer is D, IV foscarnate. And let me actually take you through the mechanism and why the other answers are not quite as good. But the key point, first of all, is that foscarnate is a drug that essentially bypasses the mechanism resistance that it causes the acyclovir resistant herpes simplex. And again, for the younger clinicians who may not have seen this, acyclovir resistant herpes was a major problem years ago earlier in the epidemic. And for those of you that may have been involved in some transplant um, infectious diseases, you will see this in transplant settings because of the severely Im immunosuppressed patients. So really what you have to have is a, a dual effect. You have to have an immune compromised individual and, uh, and chronic acyclovir use. And that's the setting where you usually see these acyclovir resistant herpes lesions. Now foscarnate, for those of you who've never used it, is a very toxic drug. It is definitely the drug of choice here, but do not take this drug lightly. It can cause severe side effects with electrolyte disturbances, renal insufficiency, um, and, and we really have even seen severe hypokalemia and calcium and even ele uh, electrocardiogram changes where torsade has occurred with, with foscarnate as well, too. Now, what about valacyclovir? Why does valacyclovir prove to be a poor choice with acyclovir-resistant herpes? Just to remind everybody, valacyclovir is just the prodrug of acyclovir. Valacyclovir is hydrolyzed at first pass metabolism in the duodenum and in the liver, and this is an enzyme called valacyclovir hydrolase that converts valacyclovir to the L-valine in acyclovir. So really, when you give valacyclovir, you're just using a nifty mechanism to get higher doses of acyclovir systemically. So that will not overcome acyclovir-resistant herpes. 
So what's the mechanism for acyclovir-resistant herpes? The mechanism is that herpes infection inside of a cell is associated with viral production of an enzyme called thymidine kinase. Now, we use this to our favor because the drug acyclovir, when it enters the cell, is actually phosphorylated by the viral thymidine kinase. So the TK or thymidine kinase activates acyclovir. So ironically here, the virus is in essence killing itself because once phos the phosphorylation has occurred by, a by the herpes virus, then the cellular kinases can kick in and get acyclovir to its active triphosphate form. Once the active triphosphate form has developed, then you can actually inhibit DNA replication, much like the HIV antiretroviral medications work. So what about acyclovir-resistant herpes? What happens? What happens is, in most circumstances, the virus shuts down the production of thymidine kinase. Once thymidine kinase is shut down, the initial phosphorylation step is not performed. You do not get good activation via the cellular kinases. You get poor acyclovir triphosphate formation, and you, in essence, lose your ability to inhibit DNA replication. Phoscarnate bypasses this whole mechanism completely and goes directly to the virus and inhibits the DNA polymerase directly. Therefore, it's a very active drug. Now, gancyclovir and valgancyclovir do go through the, the cellular kinase pathway, and, and they are a little bit more active than acyclovir, but they are not reliable because you tend to have overlapping resistance. So phoscarnate has really been shown to be the drug of choice in this setting. Now let me move on to case four. This is an individual who presented with about a six to seven day history of these lesions on his chest. They were vesicular, they had an erythematous base. He originally thought these were from moving some furniture, but as it turned out, these were indeed um, lesions that we were suspicious of herpes zoster. He had these lesions on his back as well too. So the patient actually didn't seek medical care to further than five days after the onset of these lesions. The question to ask you at this point is, would you still treat this individual considering these lesions had been there for more than five days? Yes or no? So the correct answer here is actually yes. So here is the summary for what the recommendation is in the DHHS, CDC, NIH, um, overall 2009 OI prevention guidelines. They state prompt antiviral therapy should be instituted in all immunosuppressed herpes zoster patients within one week of rash onset or any time before full crusting. And I should have mentioned this, this individual CD4 count was less than 200 at the time he presented with these herpes zoster lesions. In terms of the therapy, this is very similar to managing herpes simplex, but note that the doses are significantly higher. I think most of us tend to use valacyclovir, 1,000 milligrams, three times a day, simply because acyclovir, five times a day, is just very difficult for individuals to take. And typically, five to seven days is adequate for herpes zoster. Now, now, why do we initiate therapy even if we're five to seven days in? It's because of the complications that can develop. Shingles can become very severe. This is so-called necrotic, localized necrotic shingles. This is an individual who actually developed disseminated herpes zoster infection, which is more common in, in people with HIV, with advanced immunosuppression, and cancer patients, for example. Um, and, and I think because of those reasons, we tend to uh, initiate treatment because it's safe and it prevents these more severe complications with herpes zoster. The last case is I'd like to show you two particular patients who had very similar findings of these dark discolorations on their body. This is an individual on his foot where he's got these two discolored areas. And then this individual has this discoloration on his nose. They're slightly raised, they're darkened in color, and they are papular. They are not vesicular and they gradually developed. So the question is, what's your diagnosis? And the second, what's the name of the virus 
that causes this disorder. So both of these individuals have Kaposi sarcoma, and the name of the virus that causes this, just to remind everybody, is HHV8, or human herpes virus type 8. And this is just an example of a much more obvious uh, clinical finding of Kaposi sarcoma, where you see these multiple raised, hyperpigmented, reddish-purple discolored lesions on an individual. This diagnosis is not difficult. It's more difficult in the scenarios like I showed initially, where you get a slight uh, discoloration papular lesion that's isolated or only a few spots on the body. And the significance of this is this indeed is an age-defining illness. If you've not seen individuals with Kaposi sarcoma, remember that, that they can develop lesions in their gastrointestinal and pulmonary tract and can develop severe systemic disease. And clearly, antiretroviral therapy is the first modality for these individuals. However, if you have severe disease or, or uh, disease that's in the pulmonary or GI tract, then you may need to use systemic chemotherapy. So with that in mind, let me stop and see if there's time for one or two quick questions.